Hello and welcome. I'm Hi C, and this is Toku Rev, your introduction to Tokusatsu movie and TV shows to help you decide what you want to spend your time watching. Time to say hello to our old friends in the Ultra franchise and take a trip into the Ultra Galaxy Mega Monster Battle. Debuting in December of 2007 and ending in February of 2008, with a 13-episode run leading into the second season, Ultra Galaxy Mega Monster Battle is an adaptation of Bandai's arcade card game Mega Monster Battle Ultra Monsters, where players purchase scannable cards, varying from monster cards to cheer or trick cards, along with fighting move combo cards. Ultra Galaxy Mega Monster Battle was the first of the Ultra series to be broadcast on Japan's broadcasting station in a pay-per-view format. Currently, it is watchable legally on Channel Toku. If this series is something you'd be interested in, it's cheap and worth the price for this and Gridman alone. It's been 500,000 years since the last known monster was seen. Humanity has reached the space age, and the group Zap Spacey is now exploring the galaxy and seeking new resources. The crew of the Pendragon is going to a research facility on planet Boris, where communications have been mysteriously lost. Their ship suffers heavy damages entering the atmosphere, forcing them to crash land on the surface. Investigating a nearby city, they are shocked to discover two full-scale monsters battling each other. After taking shelter, the crew notices the remains of a Pegula monster, when a man suddenly shoots a hole from inside the creature and walks out. This is our protagonist, Lei. Quickly fainting, he is taken back to the Pendragon to recover, as the crew wonders about the identity of Lei and how he got in and out of the monster. The Red King from the earlier battle comes running towards their ship. Lei awakens and runs outside of the ship, pulling out his Battlenizer and summoning a Grimora, similar to the game mechanics of the arcade game. Gamora defeats the Red King and returns to Lei's Battlenizer. From here, it's up to the crew to discover the mysteries of Lei's past and his abilities to control monsters while butting heads at every turn. Like most giant kaiju shows, the appeal here is watching the monsters fight. I think using the mechanics of the arcade game in Ultra Galaxy gives more life to both mediums. I love the idea of Ultraman Pokemon, collecting different giant kaiju to battle it out and save the day. The design of the Battlenizer isn't my favorite. I once had a job as a network engineer, and we would test line connectivity with a mod tap. And the Battlenizer reminds me of a cross between a mod tap and one of those days of the week pill organizers. That said, it doesn't bother me, it's just a really boring design. But the mechanic of summoning monsters and having their stat card come up on the screen is really cool. If I was a kid growing up watching this show with an arcade counterpart, I would be eager to run out and play the game, sinking my allowance into scannable cards. But as an adult, I still wish I could run out and play the game. In the show, the monster suits definitely show their age, with visible wear and tear, needing either a lot of love or just new monster suits fabricated. But this doesn't take away from the battles. They are super fun WrestleMania-style battles. There's just something about it being two or three giant monsters fighting it out, opposed to a monster versus an Ultraman that makes it just a little extra fun when they do ridiculous things. It's like watching a video game that has monster AI that will fight itself if you don't engage. You've grown so used to cheering for Ultraman in these battles that it just feels refreshing to cheer for a monster to win. Throughout the show, we get to know the crew of the Pendragon. While there are definitely some archetypes thrown in, I really like how real and varied the supporting cast feels. The captain of the Pendragon is Huga, a hot-blooded leader who only wants to be referred to as boss. He's seen a lot of the galaxy and calls on his experiences when needed. Haruna, deputy of the Pendragon, who has a harsh personality and can be hard to deal with. She does not warm up to people easily and grows ever more suspicious of Lei. Kamano, the Pendragon's engineer, he's your typical modern Marvel who graduated from the MacGyver school of fixing things. And then there's my favorite crew member, Oki, the rookie of the crew. Majoring in monsterology in school, inside of this bad situation, Oki is the only member excited to learn that monsters still exist somewhere out there in the universe. The chemistry works really well. The cast size feels just right, everyone getting enough exposure to make them feel like their own character outside of their lone wolf or quirky smart guy archetypes. Bouncing back and forth in their feelings on their ever-changing situation as they try to escape the planet of Boris and its mysteries. Let's talk about production. One of the things I love most about the Ultraman series is Subaraya's use of miniature sets. They're basically the best in the business. Suddenly, 
We are on the desert planet of Boris, and, well, there really aren't any miniatures to be found outside of a couple of rock formations used to bash each other's heads in. The rest of the time, they're just fighting on a green screen. It doesn't destroy my immersion, but somehow it does kick me out of the scene for a second. There are times when I think things look well done, and times when I think things just look a little goofy. This extends to the cast whenever they leave the Pendragon. There are some shots that use decent props, but whenever it's obvious that it's just a couple of crew members sitting in front of a green screen, I get taken out of the shot. But there are plenty of times that it really drags me in. Anything shot inside of the Pendragon, I love. It's just a great set. I would have appreciated a little bit more in the way of mood lighting, but every shot in the show is evenly lit with very little in the way of shadows or any kind of dramatic lighting. This is also true of the cockpit views of the smaller jet planes they use to explore Boris. However, the Pendragon itself and its smaller jets are CG fabrications. But since the surface of Boris is as well, it skims by in most shots and manages to blend in pretty well. But if they're zooming past the giant monster suit or even just sitting in the background with another live or practical effect, but in the deep well of bad toku CGI, you could do far worse. I already spoke about it a little bit. But the style when it comes to the collectible cards from the arcade game, I think is a nice touch. When I originally watched the series, I didn't know the arcade machine existed. And I honestly just kind of love seeing the monster's name and stats laid out. Or like in episode 2 when suddenly a giant Joran plant sprouts up, spewing poison, mimicking someone scanning a trap card into the arcade machine. It's a great touch. And finally, I'm learning some of the ultra monster names that I always used to forget. So, can I recommend Ultra Galaxy Mega Monster Battle? Well, if my scale was Ultra 7X being a 1 and Ultraman G being a 10, I'd say Ultra Galaxy gets a 7. It has a lot of fun things going for it. I think the monster fights are one hell of a good time. Perfectly punctuated, every time it goes to a commercial break and shows a battle clip with some of the happiest music playing over it. I left the story a little vague, and that's because while what's there is good, there isn't a lot of it to go around. I'll say it's perfectly serviceable, and I cared about the mysteries, even if I was never dying to see the next plot point. I just wanted to continue to enjoy the big monster wrestling and enjoy my time with the cast as they develop. Ultra Galaxy Mega Monster Battle is an Ultraman show with no Ultraman, and I'm personally excited to dive into season two. Thank you everyone for watching. I have so much Ultraman I want to dive into, I'm not even sure where to go next. So if you have any suggestions, feel free to leave a comment or reach out on Twitter. Until then, I'll see you next time for more Toku Introductions.